This podcast is supported by Siemens, your partner for industrial grade AI. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of our Industrial AI Podcast. My name is Robert Weber, and next to me is... Peter Sieber. Good morning, Robert. How are you doing? I'm fine, Peter. Peter, we are here with another Peter today, because Dr. Peter Curtis, CTO of Siemens, has invited us to Munich. Hello, Peter. Hi, oh, good morning, and hello, Robert. Thank you for the invitation. You are a busy man, so let's get started with the podcast. My first question is, what was your first prompt and what was your last prompt you wrote? My last prompt. Um, and your first. My, 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 my first prompt was that I checked on what makes a good leader. Okay. What was the answer? Um, actually, it was not that bad. Okay. Um, it, it had all the qualities about being courageous, uh, learning a lot and trying things out. And I think this is perfect for what we are about to talk about. And what was your last prompt? My, my last prompt is actually where I checked whether we could use any kind of large language models to program our automation code. Mm -hmm. And and so we checked whether we could use our PLC, the semantic, and whether it could generate the code. Uh, and I have to say that was that was so so. We had, last week we had an episode with Professor Dr. Marco Huber from Fraunhofer IPA, sure. and we talked about the code interpreter, the next big thing from from a large language model. Maybe you sh should listen to this because it goes in the same direction using all, using the code interpreter to do the first steps that data scientists should do. Yeah, but you mentioned a large language model. Every week there's a new large language model. Last week Llama from Meta was launched for a commercial version. Why do we always need US infrastructure or will be there an industrial large language model from Siemens at some point? Well, uh, and, and Robert, allow me to take a step back yeah. and really say that we believe that the industrial world is very different to the consumer world because it's an entirely different thing if you are going today on a large language model, um, everything that are available, and then you get, of course, an answer. Now, that answer might be true or not, because there's a lot of still hallucination, mm -hmm. which we all know, because it's about, of course, as you know, it's all about likelihood. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the data sources. We need to understand of how this actually has been trained. So therefore, in the industrial world, mm -hmm. uh, we need precision. And that is why we are really looking at reliability, accuracy, and in particular, trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. And so we think that there is still a lot to be had mm -hmm. But it will take some time to make them as industrial grade, as we would say, that our industrial customers are going to use it. So you're working on a Siemens large language model? We do. And uh, we, do, however, in, in the way that we take already existing models and then we do reinforcement learning and we retrain them on the very specific domain expertise that we have, such as in engineering or in automation. Where do you see the use cases for a Siemens large language model? Well, it's in many different ways. It is one uh, in, of course, everywhere where we apply it to ourselves, and this is like no other, right? So, so like, like anybody else. So where we look at how can we use it in HR, in legal and such. But then the more interesting thing is where it comes down to the human machine interface for our products in particular. Mm -hmm. And that's the way where, of course, today we know that many of our factory workers in particular on the shop floor They, for example, then don't open up tickets in order to, you know, raise a concern this machine is not working or not. Mm -hmm. And the way we approach this is use your own words, your own language, completely in layman terms, and just talk in your own language, not in foreign language, but in your own language. And then we use that large language models in order to deploy it, parse it, understand it, structure it, and then send it to the respective software engineers to, to, uh, to look at it. Uh, yeah, I want to concentrate a bit more on the uh, industry grades, as you already said, you know, B2B is not the same like B2C. And there's a, there's a big advantage to it as well when we come later, maybe to trustworthy AI. But I would like to know from you, I mean, AI is not new for Siemens. You have been working with AI, and I assume kind of implicitly industrial grade for many years already, right? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, since since I mean, the, the field in itself is as old as almost is, is like any computer science is, right? In the 1940s, 1950s, even Turing himself, he already started that field, and then with the conference in 1956. Now, I wouldn't go as far back, but but we've been working with large language, not large language models, mm. but with neural oh, networks. Oh, that's a surprise. Now, that's right. Yeah? <laughs> well, large language models too. We started 10 years ago, I would say. And we have a, quite a number of patterns already. But, but of course, we built uh, neural networks already 30 years ago, uh, and then they became deeper and deeper, also driven by data availability for one, but then second in particular with uh, the increase of compute power. Now, let me give you a few examples. We have, for example, not a self-driving car, but we have a self-driving tram. So, so uh, a tram in Potsdam, actually, that detects obstacles, uh, any, any kind of uh, issues in the train and in itself. So this is all based on, on neural networks, of course. So that's not new. And in most of our products, we actually have AI embedded, which goes back to the industrial-grade AI, because usually it is trained on the data that we have or that we have generated together with our customers okay what does industrial grade ai means what is industrial grade is it a, a robustness of the algorithm or a special data set what does it mean industrial grade so great so it is really all, th all three so first off is is, is the, the reliability mm -hmm. so you ask it you get the same answer every time mm -hmm. <laughs> again right large language models not not necessary case try it mm -hmm. yourself and you get sometimes different answers second it's absolutely accurate mm -hmm. so so you can really understand of uh, what, what is there you would find this also in real life And the last one is, is the trustworthiness in the sense that we understand where that data uh, is coming from and, and what kind of biases are implicit in it mm -hmm. or not. By the way, biases is different in the industrial world. Can you give us an example? What is an industrial bias? Then industrial biases, of course, in our cases, which kinds of machinery data do you have? So, so for example, if, if you have more of this PLC as opposed to of this drive, so it really depends on what the data is coming from. That's the bias in our case. It is not the bias in the sense of the, on the human side mm -hmm. where you have a gender bias mm -hmm. or a race, a, a race bias, right? So, so that's, that's not the case in our case. Let's let's stay with that topic for a moment here because I think it is very important. We have the AI Act coming up yeah. from the European um, Commission. So how are we going to make sure then? And and maybe where is this this difference between the B to C, a lot more complex, I believe, and B to B? How are we going to make sure that the AI that you will put into the manufacturing that it's going to be trustworthy? Yeah, so, so, uh, so first on the AI Act, you're spot on, Peter. That's exactly what we were advocating for is don't treat AI as, as it is always the same. It, there's a distinction in our view if, if you apply AI in an algorithm that's consumer-based, so any kind of social media AI, it's all fine. And I understand that it needs to be regulated for many reasons. But then there's the industrial side where it's the machine data. And by the way, the machine data is really is a different topic. Because in our case, our customers are educated enough that they can determine of where and when they want to share that data. That might be different to a consumer that is not as an expert. But I can tell you, our customers do know very well the, the value of their data. So they are very explicit when they say, okay, would they share data with us? Usually they do this only if we can truly demonstrate what's going to get better for them. And second, usually it's about secondary use rights such that we will not own the data and we don't need to. But what we want to do is, of course, we are really interested in the inside so we can make the life for our customers better. So, for example, a faster algorithm or more, more precise algorithm. Now, the second part is that the AI Act does confuse quite a bit standard algorithms that have been there all along with some AI data now that's coming into it, where, of course, we have these algorithms now even enhanced by machine learning. And that creates a complication for our, our customers. What's good, though, not just to be negative, but also to be positive, is, is the, to, to make it risk-based. Uh, I think that that is a good one, except that the question always is, um, what qualifies a tram, for example? Probably we all would agree that's a more of a critical application. Sure. But then how about a robot that we program uh, that do a grasping of a certain, so, so in a bin, right, of, mm -hmm. of certain bin elements, picking, yeah. bin picking, yeah. um, How would you grade that? Um, mm -hmm. and, and which category is, is that high risk, medium risk, low risk? 
That's an interesting conversation. It depends. <laughs> it depends. It depends on what is gripping, right? If you have a fence or you have a no fence. Yeah. There you go. And and so there's so many use cases, which is really, really hard. I would have wished rather, and you, you mentioned this, Robert, earlier, why are they always coming from the United States? And, and, and it's precisely because they are so fast in trying things out. Mm -hmm. And then, then afterwards checking, okay, now where is the harm potentially being done? But first we have to demonstrate the value. That's interesting because Siemens is a global company and now we have different approaches. In Europe, we have a horizontal approach in regulation and then maybe in USA, we see a vertical approach in regulation. How difficult is it for a company like Siemens to play uh, these different regulations and to handle these different regulations? Well, it's not any different than any other company as well, because, I mean, if you want to do business as a global company that is in the United States, in Europe, and you even didn't mention China, yeah, which sure. for sure has its... I'm not the expert in regulation in China, yeah. No problem, but I can tell you it is, yet again, it's different, in particular with data, where it's coming from, yeah. how it's being trained, where it's being processed and such. Therefore, it is different. And for any global company that is in the software uh, SaaS AI space, You have to modify your approach, and we do that the same way. Except that, but this is difficult to to define every product new with a new approach with a new regulation, right? Uh, the complexity certainly has yeah. increased. Yes. Yeah. You just talked about sharing openness. When we talk about industrial foundation models, if we need them or not. Who, who has the interest? I mean, does Siemens have an interest to say, sure, we can provide our part of a, of a European, German, of a global, maybe industrial foundation model? Automation model? Or would it be more the, the, the smaller, the SMEs, the smaller, middle-sized companies? So you're spot on. Is If you think about how much it costs to build a foundation model, right? I mean, Siemens spends about six billion on R&D every year. But suffice it to say, it would be a large amount of money that would go into it in order to make this work, right? From what we hear, it's a triple digit number, usually to build your own foundational model. Now, think about a small to medium sized startup somewhere in, in Germany or in Italy where there are so many. They will have never be the, the capability of doing that. And, and so I think this is where we as Siemens can have the value and bring the value. I should also say, though, that we will build on existing models and then whether really do the adaptations in our industrial world. Mm -hmm. Of course, still making it industrial grade such that, as we discussed, it becomes reliable. It becomes trustworthy in that sense, right? So I want to come back to this foundation model you mentioned. You work with existing models, right? And you mentioned that there's also Siemens LLM in the future, in the near future. Maybe you can go a little bit more details. Do you also use their existing models or you build from your own? So we have to differentiate between AI, industrial AI, that is basically not necessarily built on foundational models, mm -hmm. but that is simply based on neural networks, yeah. machine learning, right? And that's that we're going to continue to, the, the way we do. This is going to go, you uh, mentioned the uh, bin picking, right? So, so these algorithms, we're going to continue to build. We don't need a la large foundational model. Bread and butter that. business. Bread and butter business, there we go. Now, this idea and the notion of, of the, the foundational models is relatively new. So, so we have to explore and see where it goes. Right now, as I told you, this same answer now, is we will not build our own foundation models from scratch, mm -hmm. uh, but rather take them, adapt them, and, and based on, on the data that we have today. Mm -hmm. And again, this is early days, uh, something where we, where we work. I can give you two examples where we've done this already is together with Microsoft, because this is what we've shown also at Hannover mm -hmm. Fair earlier this year, where we showed that uh, number one is that integration into our PLM software, which is Team Center, so mm -hmm. product lifecycle management software, where you actually now have uh, ChatGPT embedded so that, that your interaction with the PLM software becomes more seamless. So that's one. And the second one is where we have it uh, integrated into our automation designer. This is now getting interesting because this is now getting to the question about code. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, of course, what we're looking at, can you use uh, LMMs for coding, mm -hmm. uh, in particular in the automation space? And that we have to see. Now, um, and this is how we started the conversation. Our early tests would tell us that um, it is really good for documentation. Mm -hmm. 
And that's good news because software developers don't like documentation. Sure. So therefore, if you can already get rid of something that they don't like, that makes them more productive and more happy. So, mm -hmm. so we like that idea. Uh, the second one is actually for uh, code testing, uh, mm -hmm. so that you can run a larger amount of, of tests in that sense, which is good too, because with that, we can make it more reliable and more accurate. And so in that sense, that's good too. Then code optimization is a wonderful thing where we are still a little bit earlier in, in really exploring how good it is. But I've seen already 100 lines of code then reduced to 10 lines of code simply because it does do the optimization. That's wonderful too because that gets to the efficiency and, and the size of the models. But comes the last point, which is, of course, the, the one that we are all looking at is, is the software code generation in and itself. And there, I would say, This is early days. Uh, this is where we, and that's, now I repeat myself again, is really where we, we take our own data, we, we look at it, and we have to see how accurate it can be. Because, again, we have to avoid hallucination, mm -hmm. and that is not good yet. That's interesting, because in our opinion, many use cases in the industrial sector can be solved without LLMs. My question is, do we overestimate LLMs? I would say a careful a careful yes uh, and the reason being and i was wondering really why were we so all surprised uh, when this came up mm -hmm. and i would say at least in my humble opinion uh, two reasons number one because large language models are so generic they cover such a general purpose that everybody can touch mm -hmm. them so it's relevant for everyone so so that's that's really why i think There were meetings uh, in March and April where every single meeting would start, okay, mm -hmm. now have you tried this, right? Yeah. So, so I've never seen anything like that before. I mean, not for, for any kind of technology because it is so pervasive. It's, it's, so, it's so encompassing. And the second one is it's so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is just the human-machine interface. It, it, it behaves so natural. So, so therefore, this is really something that is relevant for everyone and everybody can use it. So wonderful, right? Yeah. That's why I think everybody was, was so excited talking about it. And it's good because with that, we can get it much more deeper into the organization, into everyone's, let's say, toolbox. Now, step back when we learned about also this this so many discussions we were wondering though because again we are using it quite a bit let me let me give you an example if, mm -hmm. if you don't mind mm -hmm. where where we've done that wonderfully is um where we've been actually building an ai algorithm uh, or ai which is based on physics algorithms mm -hmm. for our uh, colleagues at siemens energy mm -hmm. So what they've done is they were... But it's without the LLM, right? That's without the LLM. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, but, but this is a pure AI product, right? Which really, really is becoming better. So what they've done is they, four years ago, they wanted to design a new gas turbine. Mm -hmm. And when you design a new gas turbine, it's really complicated because it is working at temperatures where usually the metal would be melting mm -hmm. because the temperature inside of the gas turbine is so much higher. So therefore, the whole flow of air is, is really important. And so it has to resist overheating, mm -hmm. but you also have to ensure thermal fatigue. In order to do so, you have to run many, many, many experiments in order to make sure that your turbine is working at the most efficient level. Now, you can, as you can imagine, there's so many different paths that you can take. If you use AI, in this case, it was what we called uncertainty-aware AI models that really was trained on huge data sets from the past. Mm -hmm. We could direct the engineers' teams precisely in the direction where the likelihood of success was much higher. Mm -hmm. So you would not do all the calculations, but you could always take the next next step in understanding about probably this is going to be the one that's going to give you the best improvements in your design iterations. Mm -hmm. With that, they were able to actually cut out a year in terms of development. Mm -hmm. And today, this gas turbine is, is one of the best in the world. So suffice it to say, this is how it started. We took this AI and now incorporated it into our heat software, which really is helping you to design and simulate. Uh, we call this Sherpa X. We're testing this with customers. Mm -hmm. This is embedded AI, right? And it has nothing to do with large language models. This is embedded in AI in many of our products. From Bill. But when you discuss with your customers now, I think when the first iPhone came on the market, this was this iPhone effect and everybody wants to have a better human machine interface. And there was a boom in, in usability and user experience. Is it a door opener to discuss with small and medium sized enterprises about maybe other 
AI, industrial AI use cases with them, not all because now they are aware of, okay, we can do something with LLMs, but then Siemens will tell us, no, you can also do this, this, and this. Potentially, this is, um, I, I mentioned this, this heat software and the, and the Sherpa Plus thing is that um, that's the, the embedded AI, but still, you know, you need to be a sophisticated engineer to use it. Right. Mm -hmm. What if we were to use the LLM on top of it as a human machine interface to make just that work? Mm -hmm. And we have the first prototype that we showed two weeks ago also to customers. We're exactly getting to your point. The idea is making a complex technology really easy to use. Mm -hmm. And that's where we, we think uh, large language models can help quite a bit in that human machine interface. Where do you see the balance? My final question to you, having learned so many things of so much potential. So potential is all about productivity improvement. Uh, probably most of your um, Siemens colleagues as well. But on the other hand, it, it may mean that you know certain jobs are, are going to change. I believe personally that all jobs will be changing. So where do you see that balance? Bottom line, you know, industrial AI as a as a, a potential as a Uh, or is it a, is more of a threat? And how do you deal with that as a, as a global organization? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And uh, it really goes back to the conversation that the technology has to serve us humans. Uh, five years ago, we, we started in healthcare, actually. We, we, we developed uh, something that we call the AI Red Companion. So AI, Red for Radiology mm -hmm. Companion. So every word matters here. So it was uh, helping radiologists or this helping radiologists to better diagnose by more reliably counting, for example, lung nodules mm -hmm. in your chest CT that you had, your computer tomography pictures, and just do the calculations, the counting and everything. Mm -hmm. It does it very reliably. The, the reason why we call it companion is because it has to serve the radiologist. Mm -hmm. Because at the very end, still somebody is going to be liable. No matter if it's the car, it's the train, it's the robot, it's the, the radiology department, they are held accountable if something is not working properly. And so that's why we said, okay, let's start with the idea of companion. And back then we, we said, not AI is going to substitute the radiologist, but those radiologists that actually use AI is going to replace the ones that don't. Yeah. So take that analogy to almost anything that we're doing today. We believe it's, it's a mighty tool, but it will not entirely replace the humans. Pretty much like, like what we've seen with robots, right? In the 80s, 90s, mm -hmm. we've seen robots on the shop floor. To me, AI now is something that is happening, implicant code on the software world, right? And, and the, so what we've seen on the blue color side, we see this now on the white color side. But if you do the math, We haven't lost jobs. We haven't lost jobs on, on the shop floor. We made them, you know, more enjoyable. We made them less onerous for the respective person to do repetitive work over and over again. And that's what you also wouldn't see then for the, for the coming years. Exactly. And, and I foresee that analogy to robotics uh, that happened on the shop floor and continues to happen, by the way, because still there's, you don't have the black factory, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and so meaning there's... No Everybody's people. looking for yeah. new workers. <clears throat> that's right. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, if we can free up people... Mm -hmm. that are doing repetitive work, that are honors to the, them and in themselves, that's good. And that gets me to your question of where will we see this? Probably we're going to see it where there's most of the data and, and there's sufficient data available, which is probably the ones where most of the jobs are that are repetitive over and over again. So encoding, definitely, that would be a really interesting one. Think about Uh, software engineers that really could focus more on which problem that they want to solve than writing down yet again the same procedure over and over again. That's great. It's good productivity and it uses what we are good at humans is, is really that creativity understanding about solving the next generation of problems. But for that, last point is you need to involve the humans from the very beginning. Because otherwise they will argue, you know, that's, that's a threat to me. You're do, just doing that in order to replace me. And that is actually the wrong argument. You said that, well, is we already, at least in Europe, in China, we have a massive amount of people that we are going to miss, mm -hmm. right? And, and so if we can help actually to fill these jobs, that's good. But for them, you need to educate. And so your idea of this KI in the cantino, or AI in the cafeteria, <laughs> no, I, 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 I saw that. It's exactly what, what I think. It's a wonderful concept. Please continue to do so because there's so much myth about AI and misconception. Uh, and if we together explore this, that again, technology is serving the human and not the other way around, then I think we're good, on a good track. My last question is, how difficult is it to sell AI, to make money out of AI? 
Okay, so uh, let me let me back up. Uh, is today we don't sell AI per se. We, mm -hmm. we sell today any kind of uh, again trains, mm -hmm. robots, PLCs, uh, anything like that that is becoming smarter because of AI that is embedded. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you cannot say, and this piece of, of the solution that we provide you is going to cost you as much. Mm -hmm. We are starting to do that in terms of uh, really providing AI as a standalone to our mm -hmm. customers. Selling models? Selling, um, let's say, the infrastructure mm -hmm. for doing that today, not the models themselves, but today mm -hmm. the infrastructure. There's the whole discussion about where the compute will be of the future. Mm -hmm. And so there, um, the industrial edge is something that is really important mm -hmm. to us. So where we bring compute power down to the shop floor mm -hmm. because you need low latency or you don't actually want to have the data to leave the premises or it doesn't make economically sense. So this is where the industrial edge is there. And this is where we have already AI extensions today. We have an indus industrial AI accelerator called the Cimatic mm -hmm. TM NPU. So, so in that sense, this is what provide then also for more sophisticated industrial customers that want to deploy their AI algorithms on that, that infrastructure. But is it more expensive, these tools then? It, it, can you, what is the price of the AI in a semantic? I probably cannot even break it out to you because you cannot buy it standalone, as I okay. said. Okay. And one more thing is the MLOps business. I think that could be also a very interesting business use case for Siemens to provide these MLOps to your customers because the big AWS, Microsoft, they are not so deep into this domain-specific processes and you need to have this MLOps infrastructure. Is it a, a business opportunity for Siemens to go into this MLOps Let's put it that way. Um, first and foremost, we listen to our customers what they need the most. Mm -hmm. and, and they would tell us, to your very point, is that they are usually, their domain is specific. Usually it's also because the ontology, so the semantic in the industry is very specific. So think about buildings, think about automation, think about in particular mobility. It's it's very, very different. So for that, you need to actually have the deep domain know-how mm -hmm. to exactly understand the data formats and the ontologies that are being used in the industry. So number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is, in particular, the smaller to medium-sized enterprises that will, will tell us, you know what, if you have a means of uh, hosting and operating the, the, those solutions for us, that's great for us because mm -hmm. that actually reduces our capex spend so that you have less investments. And uh, and we are just fine of, of just having the OPEX, so the the, mm -hmm. the the recurring spend of it. So so that's what we listen first mm -hmm. and foremost. And our customers clearly indicate as Siemens, you can help us because you can build the infrastructure to provide that. Mm -hmm. Peter, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Peter, thank you. Thank you, Peter.